Cool. So what we plan on doing was talking a little bit about the paper. One, why it's so interesting for us in particular is we started studying um, spider silk independently in January of this year. And what we were trying to do originally was to get a bunch of data that could link the primary sequence and the mechanical properties. Um, if we could create some sort of data analysis or an ML model around it, so we had a huge, um, it was really hard in getting the data and asking scientists for their raw data for whatever reason, we didn't get as many replies as we had hoped. Um, so seeing this database that was created essentially provided what we have been trying to do for the first like three months as we started exploring spider silk. So just to know that so many different avenues can open up as people better understand the relationship between the primary sequence and the the final structure um, with this database is remarkable, but um, you have actually studied other insect silks too. And I know you had mentioned working with other labs for recombinant expression, which is something that we're gonna be doing um, with yeast. So we also wanted to kind of pick your brain a little bit more, understand what you think are the biggest avenues um, for exploration. Cause you did mention that just like the basic research route isn't really being done, even though there's a bunch of commercialization interest for spider silk. And we hope to kind of contribute to that um, lack of basic research. So just pretty much understanding um, the mistakes that you may have made in the past, what you think is uh, potential areas of exploration, um, what you would avoid when it comes to recombinant expression or the absolute no-nos, just general guidance and wisdom that you might have. Um. Uh, okay, so you'd sort of um, uh, a bit of a summary of of what's gone right, and what's gone wrong. I suppose is that the, um, uh, particularly in terms of trying to uh, you know, establish maybe a um, uh, yeah, yeah, you mentioned uh, recombinance and, and and building some um, and engineering some silks. Um, yeah, so it's a little. As the recombinance engineering, um, but we're also looking at some other things like um, uh, hybridization with celluloses to build to build wearables and things. At very very early, very you know not 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 even yet a prototype type stuff uh, with that. But um, we are running into obstacles and we are making mistakes, so there are lessons to learn, I suppose, even. When, you, when you're sort of very raw at this sort of thing, because like I said, I'm not an engineer, I'm a, I'm a biologist, so I'm, I'm bound to just trust what my engineer colleagues tell me about these things. Um, uh, I think uh, it's our biggest uh, issue really is that we're going quite slowly at it. Some of these things were first talked about two, more than two or three years ago, and, and now they're just, just getting off the ground. And the biggest issue uh, really has been uh, getting funds, uh, personnel, because we we sort of at universities rely heavily on students taking up the, our projects, um, and of course they there's they have to uh, that's a teaching sort of uh, project then, and they have to be learning something, so we can't um, can't throw them in the in the hot water and and just have them. Uh, learning on the run that's sort of very um very steady sort of stuff uh until we uh, we're until we're at a stage to probably get some decent funding behind it and then can um dedicate the time ourselves um so time and funding is just limited everything um but i think uh oh yeah there's probably some of the biggest um uh Difficulties have been around analyzing, I suppose. Uh, well, firstly, uh, we've, we've developed we've, on, on the um, recombinants, we've, we've, we've produced proteins and that sort of thing, but we're, we're kind of having trouble classifying them and things like that because you need to get enough. Um, we freeze dried some and they wouldn't read in an NMR machine, and then we uh, tried to rehydrate and they just ruin the proteins. And they, so there's all sorts of. Um, technical things, which I think um, it, it, even uh, when you've got good expertise, these just a, a trial and error because it's so raw, so new, some of this stuff that to, 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 try, to um, try to understand. Um, there, is good, um, there is good teams out apart from mine. Um, uh, 
there's a good team in Sweden um, and the Riken guys in Japan that uh, that have successfully synthesized their proteins, uh, done some good classifications, uh, sequencing, uh, as well as uh, spun a fiber and, and classified it. So that, 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 that info is out there. But any one scenario to the next, it's not always directly transferable too. So we've tried very similar protocols and 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 not work and then sometimes we've tried things in you that have worked better than we expected so um you know it's hard to say do this but don't do that because you just gotta you just gotta see yeah. yeah when you have the students um come into the lab and everyone else feel free to jump in and ask your questions too um but when you have the students come into the lab and you mentioned yeah. like slowly kind of ramping them up what is like the biggest piece of advice or the first step that you have them do as they have an introduction into spider silk? Um, yeah, I do, we do get students um, uh, that it's always hard to know what, um, what's, what, what you, you sort of want to cater it to what the students want to do. So you do get students uh and what they're good at already uh so you do get students um maybe uh want to do a whole bunch of things and then um uh then when you have a good talk to them and get them in the lab you, you narrow it down to just a few things they probably can and should do um so it's a little bit um uh, getting to know them and, and, and have, working through with them what, uh, what they want to get out of it and what, what's feasible because they've got to, they've got to pass and all that. It's got to be, it's got to be helpful to them. Um, but at the same time, you, it's got to, it's got to be a good challenge. Um, you can't, uh, have something, oh, I, I know you've done these sort of little things before and that, that's good enough to get you through an honors or, or a master's or something. So let's just do that. It's got to be a good, good challenge. Uh, it, we always try to think about it to, to benefit us. So um, something, a, a piece of work we've been hoping to do that haven't had a chance to do, but it it, it can depend on the student if that if that's feasible. Um, so, so like with um, so I work with a chemical engineer trying to do the bacterial cellulose uh, hybrid spider silk hybrids, and his postdocs working on it in her spare time, um, and it's just hard finding students that. that, that He's basically trying to get honours and maybe good undergrads to work on it. And it's just really, really difficult. So we haven't really got far with that because the, the students aren't there or the interest by students aren't there. Um, uh, so that's it, it's a difficult one to, uh, to do because it's, um, uh, yeah, it, it's just everything's got to come together. We, um, we were lucky with one or two students. A really good student did a recombinant um, uh, project. Um, that's where we've got most of our proteins from. His his uh, project. Uh, he also, I suppose, I think he's interested in proteomics and uh, gene expression. So, um, but yeah, he uh, a little bit, a little bit of luck from a couple of students previously trying some things that worked or didn't work. So he he was his timing was quite right because. Um, some protocols were established, but he, yeah, he just he drew on some different types of knowledge because he uh, reads a lot and around the, the the subject, and um, yeah, was able to to synthesize good proteins and do a really nice job at at, at the proteomics on it. Um, it was on the back of a grant uh, between us at UNSW, um, a, a team at King's College, and another team at uh, Arizona State called the Plus Alliance Grant. Um, so it was quite good for him to have the expertise from these other institutes as well. So a, a little bit of it was um, the support he had, but it, it was it was quite nice to see uh, that come together. But sometimes it doesn't. It's um, yeah, I've lost, uh, I've lost what initially was the point was, but it, I can't really um, comment too hard on how exactly what you say to a student that, that, that makes them uh, makes it work or doesn't work it it, it just kind of happens would that student be willing to talk to us <laughs> about the recovery maybe maybe i think i think that would be good for him he wants to do a phd 
Uh, he, he might even uh, have selected one and, and be about the star. I haven't talked to him lately. I think he would because he's he's keen on the uh, on, on the whole subject. Um, he's we're, we're hoping he writes up his honors as a paper because it, it can stand alone quite strongly um, as well. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll certainly ask him and I'll put your name forward. Yeah, his name's Anton. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do you guys want to jump in and kind of talk through either the paper or just general questions? I know we kind of had a list of things um, that we wanted to maybe chat about. I also want to hear more about the cellulose um, silk combination yeah. material. <laughs> No, oh, maybe. Um, are you interested in? If you're interested in um, that work, I could I, I could let my uh, collaborator know as well. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, it's we've we've put together a um, kind of a methods or, or theoretical how it might work piece for a book um, that's not out yet um, with, with those collaborators and a very early um review uh, of, of, of how that might possibly work in fact it's about spider silk with uh, the possibility of utilizing cellulose as kind of a um a reinforcement and, and something that gives additional properties and things like that to to so it's about can you use spider silk for clothing and then and then how how you might introduce these other fibers to to help it um and that was that was in uh, frontiers of materials and it was on the back of a, uh, a conference I went to. Um, but I didn't present on this stuff at that conference. I, I, I presented on, um, well, really on just the, mainly the, the stuff we'd done in my lab up to that point. One of the biggest ones at that time was we did some, um, uh, so we'd been trying to classify um, raw spider silk, so spiders uh, fresh, freshly spun from spider spider silk using NMR. Uh, to, to see it's um, uh, the protein uh, the protein characteristics, particularly the um, secondary structures it forms. And um, uh, by and large, we even with uh, some of our big spiders that give us good quantities of silk, uh, we still had issues with 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 signal to noise ratio um, uh, not being quite. Um, very strong to really be be certain what we're seeing um and what traditionally gets done to minimize that is the size of fed isotopes so that the the signal really enhances um because i wanted to do experiments and this is part of what i was talking about what i'm interested in in, in natural spiders what they do in the wild that sort of thing i didn't want to load them with isotopes so it's they're not spinning their natural silk sort of thing because uh, I know the person who does this work a lot. Uh, he's actually our uh, collaborator at Arizona State. Um, and a lot of the times it, when he's, he loads the spiders up with lots of isotopes of different amino acids, and it might be C13 and N15 and other isotopes, uh, the spider uh, might, be, uh, he might be able to do it once and the spider dies or is very lethargic and, and hard to silk after that. So I wanted to keep things natural. So it's, we decided to try something else. So we talked to a collaborator in Melbourne uh, about running what uh, this, uh, it's DNP NMR. So it's, it's kind of cryogenic and it really, well, rather than reducing the signal, we're, we're, we're decreasing the noise. Um, and and it, 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 we didn't know if it would work because you do have to wet it. So that kind of changes the state and potentially the, um, the uh, the secondary structures and other things, but it did happen to work, and we published a nice paper on that in, in chemical communications two or three years ago. So yeah, that, that was the bulk of my um, my discussion at, at, at this conference. But that's another piece of work that was really nice to come together. And it was a a student uh, in that. Um, uh, so I had a PhD student um, interested in sort of spider silk diversity, characterizing using NMR secondary structures, doing a, a bunch of comparative analyses. So linking sort of evolutionary biology with, with this biochemical stuff. Um, 
so he was yeah he i had him working on the nmr thing and uh yeah between us and him and then he uh took the we went down to melbourne did the did the characterization and, and, and then the student worked it up as a paper and that was a nice piece of work can you go into depth uh, more about like how you guys harvest the silk silks from the spiders like is it is there any way for us to like maybe keep spiders and harvest the silk in a lab setting um it's not that complicated but it, it, it uh, it's a little bit of a um, something that uh, comes with experience, I suppose. Um, one of the main things you'll probably need is is uh, the gas. So if you've got access to a carbon dioxide uh, facility or a big gas bottle. Uh, so we, we anaesthetize the spiders with the CO2. Probably they go in a bag or or you can you can set something up so it's a jar with the CO2 pumped in. Um, so that the, the spiders are unconscious and then they, they get pinned down on, on a uh, foam platform. And then the, I think there's, um, uh, some YouTube videos of, of this. I think the, the Oxford group have, have shown how they do their, their, um, silking. Uh, so it pins down the, the spot. You have to have the legs right up out of the way because you can't have them touching their spinnerets. You can't have them wriggling free. Um, as they as they come to and things like that so it's all strategic where you place the pin sort of keeping the abdomen steady the arms back and that sort of thing you can wrap tape across uh, across the the body as well if that if you think that helps or, or to actually tape the arms back and then uh, using a dissecting microscope you find the spinneret uh, Usually, most uh, spiders you can see the big sp spinnerets will already have silk sticking out, and that'll be the major ampullet silk if that's what you're after. So you can just uh, get a single thread of that and reel it. Once it starts reeling, it just keeps reeling. So you need a motorized spool uh, across that to reel. Uh, depending on what you want to do with the silk, you'll you'll put a different sort of head or or, or collecting device. Uh, if we're doing mechanical uh, tests. I put a big, big wide spool and wrap cardboard around it that's got holes punched in it. And I just give it, I spool it around once. So there's a single thread across all the cardboard holes. And then I cut that up uh, to make to, to make these cards with a single thread on it. And then we do tensile analysis on that. Uh, when we want to do x-ray diffraction stuff um, or something like that, where you need, you need all the silks aligned in the same direction, uh, so you can't have them crisscrossing each other. They've got to be all in lines. So I'll have a titanium or a steel card, a uh, reasonably small one with a hole in it because the x-rays will go through the hole, but the, the silk covers it. So, you know, you just line up your silk thread with, with your little hole and, and just wind it in the same direction all the time so it goes over and over each other. Uh, just for collecting for NMR or some sort of chemical analysis, uh, it's it's fine just to put a little tube on the end of your spool and just wrap it around thousands and thousands of times so there's lots of different ways uh, we've done uh, analyses where we've looked at the surface uh, either with afm or just for, for coloration uh, sort of stuff and that's where you uh, get a big long uh, piece of card maybe uh, cardboard's okay but steel would be better um, and and it's got to go around bit by bit so either you can uh, mechanically make your motor move across or you just have to move it by hand or the spider so that you got this thread running around like that um yeah amongst other things that we do because some yeah um that's the other thing we sort of thought with our uh supplying of, of the spider silk is we can accommodate all of those different methods because we've got the uh, machinery and the, the experience doing this uh, both myself and the Taiwan group. Um, yeah, so if you need need anything uh, particular, uh, we could probably do it. You also I just, oh, go ahead, Sally. Oh, I think I'm just curious about the machinery. Can you like take a photo of it and send it to us for us to reverse engineer? <laughs> or the um the 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 just the, the motorized bowl and then like yeah. where it's at. Yeah, I've um yeah, I'm pretty sure I've, I've posted uh pictures of it. Uh okay. 
around as, as um, on my website or um, uh, Facebook or I'm not sure where I post it because <laughs> I mean I don't I don't it's not it's not my personal painted uh, machinery I bought it from a from a you know a, an electronics shop and, and had some assistance putting it together so yeah I don't mind uh, I'm just thinking if if there's somewhere you could find it already but I will post up um I'll, like an email or, or or put on Twitter or something for you I think I've also put a picture in I don't know if you've seen my book but yeah, yeah I'm, I'm on your website yeah. right now shambleberry.com okay. yeah. if that's what you're asking <laughs> yeah, yeah that's yeah. that that's advertising my book that'll be mostly book stuff um yeah maybe I'll put that up yeah I am uh, uh yeah I'll grab a um a copy of this uh video too and I'll post that on that on that website and you guys also supply live spiders too right or is, or is it only the silk uh, we do, um, and it, it was sort of part of the initial intention to, to supply spiders quite a bit because a lot for some very specific analyses over the years we we bought spiders off suppliers, um, so we thought we could we could do that ourselves, um, well, yeah, because we can access particularly in Taiwan and here in Australia access to some unique kind of spiders, but all types of analyses. I think one of the difficulties we, we encountered when some we started um, getting orders for export uh, was the current climate for um, uh, for exporting is things are going very slow. So there's um, there's a big backlog in in shipping, and the potential for spiders to to arrive in in not very good condition, if at all, uh, was pretty high. So we're not uh exporting spiders in the moment. Maybe within Taiwan or Australia, we could consider it. But yeah um but if things like that change maybe and also there'd be some big permit issues in some countries so well, that, that's another thing to navigate with spiders i i was wondering if you could talk more about the curvulent silk i feel like i have a hard time understanding where that like relates to the other seven silk types if at all yeah okay um so uh Spiders that build webs um, that, that catch prey directly uh, have two types of um, sticky uh, material uh, and, they're, and they're two different uh, evolutionary branches that, that do it. Uh, one branch, uh, uh, the, the, the true orb weavers, if you like, uh, produce a, a big two-dimensional webs that's, um, uh, that, that, that are, what would you say, uh, vertically aligned um and um that th they produce a type of glue uh, called aggregate silk that, that catches catches their prey uh another type of of another branch of this of spiders produces a dry fluffy kind of capture silk um and that's cribblet silk and it's produced by a completely different um spinneret if you like it's called a cribellum uh, and it looks completely different than other spinnerets, which look a bit like fingers, and they you know, they do these things. A cribellum is a bit like a plate with, with with thousands of holes, and it just sort of produces this fluffy silk. Um, and the spider can uh, brush it and things like that to make it even more fluffy. Uh, so it's a different kind of sticky silk. So uh, cribellate spiders don't produce the aggregate uh, and the Flagelliform silk. The flagelliform is associated that that's the axial silk of those sticky spirals, but it produces cribbled silk. <clears throat> yeah, uh, it's it's somewhat of a mystery. Um, what uh, you know the evolutionary pressures and intermediates and that sort of thing going from a cribbled spinning silk to a uh, to a uh, an aggregate silk it's um yeah that, that's one of the uh the big mysteries in, in spider evolutionary biology uh, with with some good work being done on it too actually are there like any um thoughts of what applications cribbled silk 
could be used for? Um, I had a, a group um, I collaborate with in, in Germany. Uh, actually, it's a big, a big research group across Europe uh, uh, trying to understand the Criblet silk for applications. Uh, one of the things they're interested in in how the spider manipulates it to make it more sticky, uh, more fine, more sort of fibrous and woolly, uh, in order to make use laser cut a little uh, a little comb that that might be able to take fibers and and and, and make them more sticky um, for for other purposes. And it's for small scale stuff because these fibers are. Uh, Tiny, tiny things that they're probably and individually they're the smallest fibers that that, that spiders will make. Um, it's you know nanometer sized. And that's why we're we're also interested in how can you make something that small and retain some properties in it. That seems really like really a real bizarre thing. But um, uh, um, yeah, so some of the applications, I think, sort of like cellular level adhesive work and things like that, maybe within. Uh, for biomedical uh, adhesives and, and various things, so very small scale, uh, dry adhesives, so you don't need um, the interaction, the interactive chemistry with the with, with the glues uh, taking place and things like that. Uh, so it's, I think there is. It's, it's probably just going to be hard to experiment with. Um, do you think there is a way uh, to extract the silk or like? have have them spin it without harming them or like manipulating their living nature uh so not gassing them so you have to pin them down and, and yeah you can um when we um experiment with uh the glues uh we do a fair bit of work with both dry cribbolate glues and, and the wet uh, aggregate glues uh, to look at their chemistry, adhesive properties, how they stick. Uh, we just have spiders build webs, and we and we take those take those threads out of the web. Um, it's um, if you want major amphilet silk or minor amphilet, any of those other ones that we usually pull from the spinneret. Um, that's a a bit harder because, uh, but you can have put them in a container. Uh, uh, the, the the drag line silk they'll always be um that they pretty much always deposit that as they walk around uh so you could have them uh move about in a in, in an enclosure of some kind and as they move about collect up the silk that they they deposit uh there's probably just two things um it's um uh it, it could get mixed with other silks um you, know, you don't know because you're not watching what's happening with the spinnerets to know that it's definitely always major amplitude silk. Um, and I suppose you're not controlling a lot of things like the speed that the spiders are, are reeling it at. So if you're getting variation in your properties, you can't be sure where that comes from. But it depends what you want to know. If you re when we uh, do this forced silking. Um, the properties are, there's been experiments that show the properties are a bit different than they are when, when they're naturally spun. So um, if you really want to know the naturally spun, you, sh you should be collecting it as the spider walks around. It's also harder to get a lot of, um, you know, like the milligram sort of things for, for good analysis, like NMR and things um, is harder to do. Um, just relying on the spider to naturally deposit its that silk and black it up. Yeah. We've um, uh, I've always tr I tried a few times to tr try to uh, harvest silk from tarantulas or, or what's called mygalomorphs, the really old uh, spiders that don't build webs, uh, and that's hard to do because they build a really fine. It's not the same type of silk. It breaks easily. It's hard to force reel. Um, so I've got a, a, a friend in Colombia and his team. Um, who have a colony of, their, of, of, of tarantulas, uh, naturally putting depositing their silks uh, into their cages and they're just collecting it up for us to, to then do a whole bunch of analysis. And um, the thing is that's just going really, really slowly. They're doing this over a long, long time and sending bits and bits. Um, but we've started doing some analysis on that. It'd be an interesting thing to understand. Um, uh, so for some supplies, you just have to, uh, 
do the natural silking because the forced silking won't work. How would you go about cleaning silk that was harvested like that? Uh, well, probably the, um, if you, if you picked up a, a, a ball of silk and it had little bits in it, yeah, you'd be, you'd have a job getting those out, I think. So you really want to really control your conditions that you got the spider in to, to ensure that any kind of, um, contamination is minimal. Um, you probably can't help it if there's some bacteria or something in there because that's, um, uh, yeah, you know, unavoidable, but because particularly, yeah, something like these tarantulas, they're laying down their silk, so they're giving them days, weeks to just build a meshwork of, of silk and then they come along and collect it. So there's probably a little bit of build up. One thing is the spider silk doesn't, um, bacterial doesn't build up much on it for whatever reason. That's also why it's an interesting biomedical uh, material because it's, it can stay quite sterile for whatever reason. So it's um, so that's not too big of a problem, but yeah, if you've got some um, other forms of contamination, because um, once you wash it, it'll contract up and, and, and really change. So it will, yeah, and depending on what you want to do, it might be fine to do that, but there might be other reasons why you, you don't want to do that. So, yeah, it's hard. The more ancestral spiders, I know that their silks are quote unquote bad because they're not like dragline silks and not as mm -hmm. elastic, but don't they, they don't suffer from as much super contraction, right? When they're in water. Yeah, 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 it, it doesn't. And and for whatever reason, other some of the other silks like um, the minor ampullates and the cineform doesn't super contract in water as far as I understand. Um, so it's a major ampullate uh, phenomena. Uh, we know it's to do with um, the, so there's crystalline parts of the protein and amorphous parts, so non-crystalline parts. And when the non-crystalline parts are um, uh, very aligned against each other, they can slide across and, 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 and the, the fiber as a whole shrinks up. Um, so it's got to be, you have this sort of very specific structure, also specific amino acids tend to promote it more than others. So um, it seems to be those reasons why major, uh, major ampullates uh, super contracts, but um, there also seems to be uh, a lot of similarities like crystalline and amorphous regions in minor ampullate and in uh, insect silks and things as well. And they don't, they don't take on the same phenomena. So it's something additional about the, the amino acids. Uh, that um, that induces it, and I think uh, we always think it's proline. I mean, I said proline is the big important one, but some um, some analyses, like even our um, big meta analysis we did uh, a year or two ago, didn't seem to suggest proline did that much. Uh, uh, a little bit, there was a slight correlation, but um, and then another group recently. Uh, I think it's tyrosine. So another amino acid that's in small amounts, but when it's there, it has a big effect. So maybe, uh, maybe it's that, maybe it's either or, or maybe uh, it's just how they work that, that, that matters, not really which amino acid it is. And when you're um, for silking them, you're just looking at the spinneret to know where it's coming from exactly in the, with the microscope, the dissecting microscope? Uh, in that it, we, we definitely want it to be major ampullate. If, 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 other, if other spinnerets are innovated and start producing a silk, yeah, we can't really use it, yeah. And I guess you control this, the rate at which it's silk as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, the, um, the machine I made, it's, um, uh, I've got a sort of like a dial one to 10, and I've kind of calibrated it with, um, with how much silk I can collect and all that. Um, but it's not speed calibrated, if you know. Yeah. So, um, uh, so I, I know where it's actually. It's almost the as soon as it starts reeling. Yeah. So it, we do it quite slow. Is about the speed I want, um, but I don't know exactly what speed that is. I um, it can be worked out, um, and I and I've and I estimate it when when I um you know, write, write about it, but um, I don't actually have a precise 
a mechanism, a good machine probably, a better machine in mind probably should should have that. So you can be absolutely sure you're drilling at a metre per minute or whatever the standard is. So a few weeks ago, we looked um, at a spinneret under a microscope and we saw the spider like starting to spin the web and it looked like there was like multiple really thin strands that got like twisted into one thicker strand. And I was just wondering, are those three, are those like multiple strands the same thing or just like different, um, have different compositions that aggregate together to form that final um, line of silk? I believe we um, saw a crab spider. Um, you know, I might have to see what's happening to know for sure, but quite possibly it, it's, because um, the two spin rates can build this, can both make major amplitude so that the two, um, big uh, spinner rates that you'll see under the microscope. Um, uh, so, it, yeah, it's hard to say, but it, it, it could well be just the same one. It could be making a, a you know, a, a thicker, sort of a, a twisted thread, and that's normal as well. Uh, um, uh, that, that spiders do that, particularly when they're building a web, that, that, that they, always, um, they always make it out of a, uh, a couple of threads. So if you look at the a, a, a radial or a bit of frame, it'll look like two 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 um, threads stuck together. Um, so I think that that, that was probably um, producing dragline uh, just just normally, uh, but, but but bringing a couple of strands together. I have a question about um, the paper. So um, at the end, there were like there was mention of computational modeling and simulation methods um, that could help with future direction for predicting the outcomes of molecular interactions between like multiple components of the biomaterial. So just wondering what your thoughts were on those about the possibilities and maybe the uh, major bottlenecks um, for those types of approaches, and also like what what types of approaches if they're like molecular dynamics simulations or um, otherwise. Um, okay, well, I suppose uh, that, that kind of running those kind of simulations, I mean, I've worked with people doing it, but it's not really um, uh, something I know deeply about. But um, really, I, I think the beauty of it is it's a bit like, um, because there's a, there's a depth of information, it's a bit like, um, it's not as massive or as intricate, but it's like the human genome or something where you can really probe. You can say, right, well, there's a, a property. Then we trace it back to a gene and things like that. And we can go right, right across spiders to see if there's a very unique property in, in, a, in a spider somewhere, we can trace it back to a gene or even a, a sequence. Yeah, a, a, you know, a, um, um, a sequence or the amino acids it codes for or anything and we can track it through so there's a lot of that kind of thing and of course um doing that individual by individuals a hard tedious job so you you, you want to develop a, a, a program that, that, that can run and, and and find those things for you um, so i think that's what that's about um i don't know uh, i suppose these are kind of a bit uh, a bit like ai models or something uh, you, you tell the uh, computer, you know, you run you run loops and you tell the computer if it sees this, run, run this computation, if it sees something else, yeah, uh, for and if loops and all that on, um, uh, on some sort of programming language. I, I think that's what, what, what you'll do to do them. And that would be exciting to see happen because it, it's um, quite quickly with somebody who's, who can draw these things up quite quickly really understand what's happening. You can, you can get uh, good causal models of uh, a gene change and a, and a change in the in fiber property uh, and, and, the, and the intermediate steps as well. So it can be, could be really interesting. Um, yeah, I'd certainly uh, encourage uh, students to, 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 to try working on that. That really opens up the door for a lot of new projects because um, I mean catching spiders and spinning the spiders and dissecting them and getting the genes is is all interesting and there's uh, there's still merit to doing that I don't think that's dead but um, this uh, solves a lot of problems that, that are faced by by just building this big database with this information already in it um, for, for students 
uh, even um, um, people are just interested in how does that gene work they don't necessarily want to know spiders you know that, the, the, the ins and outs of spider evolution or or even the silks it's just a, a certain gene can give a certain property in a fiber and how does that work they can look at this database so it's um its applications are pretty immense really how do you um have you considered categorizing the like the nutrition of the spider to also have like an additional um, potential input as to why the silk is a certain way. Because I imagine kind of like what you said, what, whatever you feed it, whether it's an isotope or something different, that's also going to change the property. I'm just thinking of all of the different potential inputs as you build a model to be able to predict what the property is based off of the amino acid sequence or vice versa. Um, how can you account for the spinning process and then potentially the nutrition of the spider as well? Yeah, we do do experiments with that. For one, to know um, the uh, to 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 control baseline stuff like the spider's nutritional history and things like that. So we uh, we manipulate manipulate diets and things to 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 be sure we uh, that's not a factor when we we do some comparisons across individual species, treatment groups, whatever. I've also done. Um, with that, uh, the, the, the postdoc I did in Taiwan did a lot of uh, nutritional effects uh, stuff, mainly for the biological thing, like if it feeds on flies or crickets, uh, does it produce different silks and why, both in terms of uh, how the web works in catching those different insects and also the knock-on effects for spiders, even looking back to the genes that it expresses as it, as it interacts with these different insects. Um, it produces different gluey silks as well, the sticky silks. Uh, in the uh, traditional orb weavers um, because uh, uh, possibly because uh, the different uh, material properties are needed to catch those kinds of insects, but also maybe there's different nutrients available which are limiting the kinds of, uh, the, the kinds of glues and things it makes. Uh, we think there's um, a metabolic effect. So um, feeding on certain insects provides amino acids that uh, relieve some metabolic stress because these things have to be synthesized or whatever. So there's um, there, there, there's a fair bit of, um, well, we think there's a fair bit of that. So it's, it is hard to control uh, everything that, that um, you could possibly do. So generally we'll, um, if we want to silk spiders for some sort of structural analysis or something, it's not necessarily an experiment on their own. Um, uh, on their ecology or nutritional history or something, would have to try and control that nutritional history. So we'll bring the spiders into the lab, feed them over a week, uh, standardized diet and these sort of things to 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 uh, reduce that background noise. Um, uh, I've tried a, a, a few regimes to see well how long that needs to be, but anything less than five days or so, you're still getting some some, um, some, some background treatment. But where, you, where you've got a limited time to do your experiments, you might you might get away with three or four days, but yeah, five days uh, on a standardized diet, because the metab metabolism is slow on that. So that's probably a feeding or two feeding cycles, um, specific diet. So yeah, that, that's all part of what uh, induces them to, to um, produce different silks. Well, I've even found uh, spiders in uh, different climates, like uh, windy versus not windy, produce a different silk. It can be tougher in the, when spun in wind, uh, or at least they've had their, been exposed to the wind and then, and then uh, put aside to spin some, some webs. Uh, those silks will be of a different property than those that weren't pro, uh, previously exposed to wind. So they look for cues and, and they can manipulate that expression. That's why it's so interesting because there's sort of biomimetic applications in that, in that um, you can, whatever the spiders are doing to cater to their own specific needs, maybe a manufacturer could exploit that and, and, and build fibers for specific needs as well. We just need to know how that all occurs. Um, may I have one question? Um, so does the age matter in terms of property of silk, the age of spider? 
it it can um or, or the sex the female or male just uh case. yeah there's there's effects of uh males and females generally females we always work with females because they're big big abdomens big spinnerets the males are, are, are smaller in the species we collect anyway uh so they're difficult to silk they pretty much stop building webs when they're adults so uh, all the things we're looking for the males aren't doing uh, but uh, studies looking at the uh, gene expression in males versus females are showing different things for one the females are producing a lot of um, uh, proteins for silks that, that, that they use to make egg sacs and things like that that males aren't uh, also they're expressing everything in, in in higher amounts because they're, they're foraging and all that that males aren't doing. Um, I think that's black widows and maybe some other species that work's been done in um, by groups in America. Yeah. Um, we did, um, so well, the, the aging, yeah, we did, we work with a, a, a spider that lives in a cave in, in Tasmania that lives up to 10 years old and gets really, the females get huge. Um, and there, we didn't age the spiders because we just we did a field trip, uh, one-off field trip, uh, collecting big versus small spiders. But we probably estimate that you know there's uh, anywhere from five plus years age difference between between the two sizes. And uh, again, this is a spider that was hard to collect the silk directly from, so we collected it from the webs because uh, they build big, massive webs, so it's uh, quite easy to collect a lot of silk from webs um in the cave so it's not not as fresh as fresh but we could do mechanical properties and some other things on it and found differences and uh if we get intermediate sizes we can see sort of a transition across so it seems um at least in spiders with this big age structure that live on time uh they they'll, they'll build the different uh different silks as they age why that is, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe because they're catching different things and they're catering for that. Maybe um, gene expression. There's a whole bunch of things that could be happening. Um, but spiders that live a short time, I don't think age is a major thing. Maybe adults compared to juveniles is a bit of difference. Um, I think uh, a former colleague in Taiwan uh, has done that on one or two spiders that lived a, a short period of time, found differences. Uh, in in um, in in spiders that live a year or two years, um, but we're, we're still looking at, at, at some of them, um, particularly spiders like a, a golden orb weaver that lives one year, but it gets really huge. So is it the size issue or is it uh, age issues? Because they can they just grow really rapidly, and uh, it'd be really interesting to know if they change their silks. Uh, also quite as much as um as much as their body changes sort of thing thank you do you know of anyone who has tried to study the speed um at which spiders can make the silk i'm just thinking randomly like if you could understand the pathway and the speed as to how fast they make a silk could you try to mimic something that could affect how fast people grow hair since that's a protein as well i don't know i know it's a completely different morphology but um do you know if there's anyone who tried to study that no I don't, as in uh how when they're naturally spinning how much that um i think one of they um so the production of silk, um, the proteins are expressed into the uh, gland. So the gland has a big, uh, the reason it's called the major ampule is as, a, as an ampule, a, a sac that collects the proteins. And then when it spins, it runs through a duct that's highly folded and all those sort of things produce uh, impact on the properties too. That's one reason we think actually why the bigger spiders will produce a different silk because they'll have this bigger folding arrangement in their, in their internal gland structure um so it's yeah so the, the the proteins will build up um so that's kind of the the secretion is into the gland as sort of soluble proteins and then it's extruded as needed as a fiber um so it, yeah it is a different thing it's not like it kind of yeah um it's, it's been kind of um secreted slowly over time they just have a store and that store can build right up and then not 
let what they need as as needed. Uh, that's why, um, uh, yeah, when a big a big spider with a lot of stored silk, we can silk them for hours and hours and hours. They seem to really have a good build up sometimes. Yeah. Wow. So, what exactly happens in those ducts? Uh, in in the, uh, uh, during the spinning. So one of the yeah. biggest, um, one of the reasons you get this, remember the alignment of the proteins that, that gives it a, a lot of properties like um, its strength and elasticity, as well as the, how much it can super contract is to do with how well the, uh, the various parts of the protein, crystalline and amorphous regions are, are aligned. Uh, so as it's been spun, there's, um, there's shear forces because the, the duct is narrowing, it's folding, there's all these sort of things. There's also pH, a pH gradient and, a, and an ion gradient and these other sort of biochemical reactions too that are kind of influencing the proteins to fold and shape and, and, and uh, pass by each other in certain ways. Uh, so all of that action produces this final silk in, in how it is, and that probably the final thing that happened is it spun through the spinneret. There's some friction at the um, at the valve, uh, so that that, that uh, has an effect on on how well those uh, regions align. That's one reason why we think when the spider's pinned down and we're forcibly silking it, um, uh, when it then when it's uh, spinning it itself, we're changing that frictional force at the valve. Um, when it's anesthetized, so it's um, it changes the properties a bit. They get a change in the the alignment. Um, but yeah, it's it's complex, and it's really the main reason why it's hard to spin uh, a spider silk because we can't replicate all the things that are happening in the gland. That's really why it's uh, why it's so difficult. Um, I guess like on a similar note, I was wondering like for your students or like for other like recombinant spider cell projects you've seen, like are they also taking into consideration this pH gradient and they try to kind of replicate that? Um, yeah, um, it is difficult because um, when you build your, your, your artificial spinneret, if you like, uh, you're limited in what you can input and, and, and uh, manipulate the uh, the liquefied silk as it's running through the column, uh, the spinning dope. Um, uh, so what, um, what often happens is you'll manipulate as best you can. You might create the conditions where you can apply the shear force. Uh, you might uh, uh, inject a focusing fluid or a fluid that, can, that has some uh, minor pH or, or ionic effect. Then you can spin the silk into a bath and then change the conditions within the bath as you reel the silk out. So it kind of um, is a different process. So you're kind of treating it post spinning as opposed to during spinning. So it's um, and for that reason, as well as some other things it, it, you often don't fully replicate the properties. So it's one of the, the hard things to do. Spinning the fibers is, is, is a big, big challenge. Um, where uh, we really haven't, from our uh, proteins we've, we've generated, uh, only just on a few fibers that, that our uh, honor student, uh, Anton, um, and uh, myself and, and, and some others I work with have, have spun small amounts of uh, fibers and it's, it's just hard to, to, to know how to, how to replicate all those conditions and, um, and, and get, the, get the fibers you want. So the experiments will long go. There's labs that have been doing this for a long, long time and are just starting to sort of work a few protocols out and get it right. But it's, it's, it's a hard job. I was kind of curious too, like after you like harvested your silk, if you've tried like plying or spindling these to like make thicker ones for different tests. Yeah, I have a colleague who's trying to do that with the live spiders. She really is really, um, uh, yeah, she's actually been able to, yeah, make a few bundles and even uh, knit a little, um, or in the, I don't know what, what it was called, cross-link a little um, patch that can super contract and do some things like this. Wow. Um, yeah, I can show you a link to that too, maybe. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's super fine work and, and um, she was trying to run it through little loops that, that was really difficult to manipulate because it's really the challenge is that the thread's so thin. Now this is freshly spun silk. You, 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 if you could 
uh, produce lots and lots of fibers synthetically, you might have better luck because you can make them a bit thicker and, and more manipulable. But at the moment, we're not making enough to, to experiment with that. But yeah, that, that, yeah. Would be the, that would be the thing you'd want to do because single fibers aren't aren't the thing you want. You want to make a material where they're, where they're uh, woven uh, and manipulated and, and, and made into strands and, and bits of fabric and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the spinning is the start of all the challenges that lie ahead. Yeah, um, there is like, um, like I, I know someone who also was collecting the exacts of her tarantula and then like made like a small like support spindle to actually like make the threads out of it and then use her needle to make a little, uh, to knit a little scarf out of it. But it was like the, but yeah. it was like the tubular set. Um, it, it was like the more fragile, like exile. Yeah. So see it, yeah. There's some companies, yeah. um, they've produced the fibers and, and hybridized them with, with, with cottons or, or something else and, and made some materials and made like a, I think uh, Bolt Threads has made a tie. Um, yeah, someone else has incorporated it in, into a shoe. It's not, it's not a spy, full on spider silk, but there's, there's some proteins in there that um, it's probably enhanced the properties of the, uh, of the thing somewhat. But at the moment they're, they're like their thousand dollar shoes and things like that. I mean, there's one of them as well. So it's like, you know, it's not, um, it's not commercially viable just yet, but at, at, there's, there's companies and individual labs that have had success with doing a little bit of this. So it's, it's coming along. And I think it's the kind of thing, I think the technology will, um, will be such that it'll just happen one day and, and, and these things will become available. So that will be, uh, uh, exciting for all of us that have been struggling along with it for a long time. Um, another thing I was kind of curious was about, like, I feel like a lot of the recombinant silks have been on major ampullae, but I guess, is that mostly driven by the mechanical properties of it? Or do you know if there's something about, like, it's a protein that's easier to express than other silk forms? Uh, actually, it's quite, it's difficult to express, but actually all, probably all the spider silks are reasonably difficult. Uh, I think um, those labs had good success from uh, doing the, some of the others, uh, cineform, flagelliform, there, there's some recombinant examples mm -hmm. that labs have produced there. Um, I, know of, I know of some that have done it. Um, the, um, but the, I think the major ample is because of it's the one that is, is trying to be commercially harvested because it's got super yeah. super high strength uh, high toughness uh, a good combination of strength and extensibility that no other material has it's totally unique and um the yeah the sort of things that potentially you could make and uh and then or it can inspire uh, as if the process is understood better and things like that is, is quite quite large um yeah there's talkable been talk of bulletproof vests from spider silk forever um but it's still a still a thought, I think, um, one day, um, or something like that, where you where uh, it's super robust, but more lightweight and more breathable and all that for for soldiers or sportsmen or whatever. Yeah, so not sportsmen, women. So um, yeah, that would be a, that, that would be a good um, technology if if it could be harnessed. Uh, I think I have to go actually. If, um, so if there's one more question, maybe do that. We can wrap it up here. Um, so I know okay. we're <laughs> away from <laughs> where we're going to end. Um, but I'll send you a follow up email if you want to, if you'd be interested in introducing us to Anton, I think, who's yep. doing the yeah. um, Yep, I can give you um, uh, some names of some potential future speakers, if you like, uh, around this topic. That I that I work with, uh, yeah, that, that, that uh, know more about some of the issues you tried to ask me about than I do. So maybe they're, they're better to speak to. Yeah, and Tom would be a good one because he uh, he can tell you about his recombinance work. It's it's pretty good. Perfect. And then if you want, we can keep you updated with what we're doing in the yeah. lab as well. And feel free to give us yes, a yes, please. And yeah, um, yeah, and yeah, potentially if there's something that Spider and Silk Supply can help you with and things like that. So, uh, we can work on work with you on that um, or anything. Yeah, um, 
Okay. Yeah, so um, definitely stay in touch. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Okay. It's fine. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. You too. Yeah. Bye. Um, did we lose Megan? <laughs> I think so. And Sally, I think. <laughs> I think they forgot we were going to. Let me just put them on Slack really quick. Then we just went. Sure. <laughs> that was really cool. Yeah. So quick question. Do we already have spiders or no? Uh, sort of. <laughs> okay. And then, like, we can, we we're doing like husbandry of them, like, we we're keeping them. No. Uh, no. So, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Jazz, um, Sally, and a few other people, they collected spiders, but they're really tiny. So, we've just been like looking at it in a microscope just to see what it looks like. And are, are you, are we gonna, are you planning to still free them? Yeah, well, one of them died. <gasps> Which one? Maybe, is this a continuation of the recording or? Oh, wait, yeah, it's not. Sorry, let me. 